survive. Does not survive. The tachyon does not survive. It's not one of the states in the theory. Okay? This projection with this minus 1 to the power f is called the GSO projection. Okay? And is a key ingredient to making superstring theory tachyon free. But there are several things about, uh, well, uh, yeah, let's focus on the NS sector first. There is something about this that might make you feel very uneasy. And that is this. What we have done is effectively project out all states with even fermion number. And the thing that, make you that might make you really uneasy about this is that states with even fermion number include the state dual to the identity operator. So it sounds like if we translate back to operator language, we have projected out all even fermion operators including the identity operator. That's never a consistent thing to do in a quantum field theory. You can't project out identity operator because when you put nothing inside the path integral, you put the identity operator. How can you project that out? So How is the tachyon removed? You see, in the partition function, we have this, this partition function. Do you understand that this part corresponds to the NS sector? Because the spatial part is antiperiodic. And that's the definition of the NS sector. Okay? Now, this term is the pure trace. Because whenever you take a trace in a fermionic theory, the time direction automatically becomes antiperiodic. This part is something else because we made the thing periodic. It's in fact, as we've discussed, the thing that changes antiperiodic in time to periodic in time is insertion of minus 1 to the power uh, f because that changes, that gives you an extra minus sign for the fermion field, psi as it goes around. But the impo really important thing is this minus sign. So this thing, if you translate to Hilbert space language, is trace of minus 1 minus Minus 1 to the power f by 2. Okay? Now, if you were going to try to project onto states with even fermion number, you would have put trace of minus 1, my, uh, trace of 1 plus minus 1 to the power f by 2. That's what you might most naively expected. Somehow, if you're going to project with fermion number, you normally think you should project with even fermion number, right? Okay? But that's not what module invariance did. Okay? It's great that it didn't do it because it got rid of the tachyon. But now that we've understood that it gets rid of the tachyon, there's something else that might worry us. And the thing that might worry us is that this seems to be projecting out states with even fermion number. Therefore, by state operator map, seems to be projecting out operators with even fermion number. And therefore, projecting out in particular the identity, which just doesn't sound right. Okay? How does this work? The way it, the, the, the thing is that this was too crude. Here we worked out this partition function in this extremely crude light code way. How did you know that? See, NS ground state corresponds to the identity operator. So if you assign NS ground state minus 1 to the power f equals minus 1, that, this is something people sometimes say. Okay? It is by itself, itself very strange because assigning identity operator minus 1 to the power f is equal to minus 1, which is inconsistent. Because you take a state, you act with identity on it, you get back the same state, but you've changed its fermion number. What does it mean? <laughs> okay? But now we're going to say the right way of saying what you just said. The right way of saying what you just said is that the actual theory also had the costs. Okay? And the state that we are, you know, what, what is being hidden here was that there was also this e to the power minus phi here. So the operator dual to the state that we are projecting out is not identity, but is e to the power minus phi. Okay? There's an even better way of saying it. The even better way of saying it is 
change our definition of fermion number to include fermion number also of the hosts. Okay, then if the fermion number is the net coefficient behind h plus the net coefficient behind phi. Okay, and I'll tell you for a, in a moment why this was needed. It's needed in order to make the BRST charge commute with fermion. Okay, uh, if you do, you know, you want what in the BRST charges we'll be seeing this lecture. You will have terms like gamma times TF, gamma times psi. You want the BRST charge to have fermion number zero, so that project, you know, so that the cohomology problem, BRST problem, can be done sector fermion number sector by fermion number sector. So the problem of finding a BRST cohomology in a particular fermion number class is a well-defined one. Okay. So for that reason, we are actually forced to give fermion number also to the ghosts, just like the superconformal ghosts, just like we, we give them to, uh, to the psi matter. Okay, and the way to do that is uh, think of the minus one to the power f being minus one to the net power that appears, not just in h, but h plus phi. Okay, now the reason that this guy appeared with a minus sign is simply that we were working in the ghost vacuum and the ghost vacuum did indeed have minus 1 to the power fermion number equals minus 1 because the ghost vacuum was dual to the operator e to the power minus phi which by a definition had minus 1 to the uh, had minus 1 to the power f is equal to minus 1. So the right way of thinking of this is that we're not projecting this is more or less what Sunil was saying we're not projecting by onto states of negative fermion number, so, uh, of odd fermion number. We're actually projecting onto states of even fermion number. But fermion number gets contribution not just from the size, but also from the ghosts. Is this clear? Okay. Uh, excellent. So uh, the GSO projection that we, go, we that, that that we do should be thought as a project, projection onto the even fermion number sector when we include the contribution of the costs, and then when you say it this way, everything is perfectly consistent. Identity continues to have even fermion numbers projected in. Everyone's happy. It's just that the the cost vacuum had e to the power minus phi equals minus one. It's more or less what you said, but said in the right way. Okay, excellent. So, now we understand at heart what is going on. At heart what's going on is that the vacuum of the ghost sector, the ghost vacuum in the NS sector had negative fermion number, uh, odd fermion number, in fact fermion number 1 or minus 1, doesn't matter. Okay, uh, and that fact projected the vacuum out. In order to cancel that odd fermion number, we had to act on it with a fermionic excitation or operator that made the fermion number even. That raised the energy of the state and raised it just enough to make the state massless rather than tachyonic. Okay, this is a key ingredient as to how the superstring works, removing the tachyon and giving you massless states. Is this clear? Is this clear? Excellent. What, what, what? No, Not mass, massless states are there. Oh. Vacuum is removed. Tachyon states are removed. Massless states are projected in. And we'll look at the massless spectrum soon. Okay. Now, before we continue, remember that even in the Raman sector, we have the projection onto minus 1 to the power f is equal to plus or minus 1. There, that, there it's a convention because of chirality of spinners, okay? And let's see how that works. Here, once again, we have to associate, give fermion number half, fermion number half to the superconformal ghost, or minus half, it wouldn't matter. There, there's some convention about it. 
okay. Now, look at the vertex operator of the Ramon vacuum. We have e to the power i h by 2 uh, plus minus i h a by 2. The net fermion number is, so let's let these, co these coefficients which are all plus or minus half, let's call them alpha a for a moment, they're all plus or minus half. Net fermion number is sum over alpha a minus half, minus half coming from e to the power minus pi by 2. I've bit arbitrarily chosen it to be minus 1. Minus half because Yes. Well, you know, the fermion number was just the charge associated with a particular symmetry. The symmetry now is being identified as translations in H plus simultaneous translations in phi. So that completely fixes it. Okay? Okay, great. Um, uh, uh, yeah, great. And another way of saying it is let's look at the bosonization formulas. This gamma has weight, uh, weight 1, and this will come multiplying some psi term in the BRST charge. So if e to the power phi has weight, uh, has weight, you know, has a fermion number half, uh, sorry, 1, then square root of e to the power phi, where I have fermion number half. OP will fix it, for instance. Right, e to the power phi by 2 times e to the phi by 2. Fine. Okay. Excellent. <coughs> so sum over alpha is minus half. Uh, has to be equal to even that was our condition. Now we have in these alpha a's we have uh, five, uh, five halves. What does it tell us? One way that this condition is satisfied is if all five are plus half because then you get five by two minus half. So that's two. But more generally, it will be satisfied if the number of odd minus signs is even. So in particular, if there were two, mi two odd minus signs, then the sum over alpha a would be half, and half minus half is 0. That's OK. If you had four odd minus signs, then sum over alpha a would be minus 2. Uh, uh, sorry, it would be minus 2 plus half. So this, this whole thing would be minus 2, which is also even. Okay, so in the Ramond sector, what is the uh, uh, minus 1 to the f projection doing? In the Ramond sector, the minus 1 to the f projection is merely telling you that the total number of minus signs in your spinner vertex operator, that the total number of minus signs in your spinner vertex operator has to be even. But you know, if you have a spinner where the total number of minus signs is even, there's a name for such a spinner. What's the name? It's called a chiral spinner. Okay. So the uh, um, uh, the, pro the the projection uh, with minus one to the power f is equal to one or minus one is projecting you either into chiral spinners or anti-chiral spinners. As we've repeatedly said, there's a lot of con there's convention involved in whether you call a spinner chiral or anti-chiral. But there's no convention involved in whether two spinners have the same chirality. <coughs> and you remember type 2a theory and type 2b theory differed by the fact that in type 2a theory, these signs were opposite. But in type 2b theory, these signs were the same. So type 2b theory is a theory with equal chirality spinners on the left and the right. Whereas type 2a theory is a theory in one, the spin on the left being chiral, and the spin on the right being anti-chiral. That, in the Ramon sector, the GSO projection has a much less dramatic effect. It just enforces a chirality condition. And the precise nature of the GSO projection tells you which chirality. 
In the NS sector, it's not a chirality condition. It's something that removes entire mass states in particular, it removes the tachyon. Is this clear? Okay, excellent. So now we have we've had our first little brush with vertex operators and the superstring. Okay? Now we want to understand this story a little more systematically. Okay. And uh, exactly as in the bosonic string, the systematic way of understanding uh, the story is through the BRST charge. Okay? So I'm going to write down the BRST current for you, and then we'll do a little analysis with that, with that, uh, with that current. Okay, I'll keep these two panels on the board because we, we might need them uh, as we proceed. So Okay, so firstly the claim, F firstly I write down a BRST current and then I'll tell you what the claim is. Okay, I'll write down the BRST current, so JB is equal to, well, parts of it are very familiar, they're just what we had in the bosonic stream. So there was C by times T bosonic matter. Uh, and then there's the supersymmetrization of that. So that's, I mean, the supersymmetric analog of that. So gamma times T fermionic matter. Okay? And then there is half plus half C T G. That's T G bosonic plus gamma time, uh, times T G fermion. Now, you guys remember what this T B and T G, T F was, right? You remember there was a super multiplet of stress tensors when we were studying our super conformal field theory? You remember that one way of writing the super multiplet was curly T was equal to T F plus theta times T B. We went through this in great detail, if you remember. Okay, this TF was a dimension three by two, odd, odd spin current, a fermionic current. This TB was a dimension two, even spin current. This is the usual stress tensor. This is a supersymmetric partner of the stress tensor. Okay, when I write TBM, I mean T, this part, the full bosonic contribution of the matter stress tensor. And when I write TFM, I mean this part of the matter sector. So it's built entirely out of matter, but is odd in fermion fields. On the other hand, here when I write TBG and TFG, I mean the same quantities for the ghosts. Um, if you look at our notes from last semester, we've written down explicit expressions, of course, for these. Here it's basically side LX. Yeah, it was del x del x plus uh, uh, plus what was it? Psi del psi. Okay, and we also wrote down more cumbersome explicit expressions for these, which I won't try to. You know, basically, right? It's a del b c and all of that that stuff. The term which is del of b c and there are lambdas and all. okay, all of that. Okay. Now, this is the BRST current, and this BRST current obeys all the good properties. Okay, it obeys all the good properties uh, that the BRST current in the uh, in the bosonic theory obeyed. In particular, J of J B of Z times J B of zero. Well, there was some one by z. Uh, so let's firstly let's look at the uh, um, the dimensions of this this current. Okay, um, c times del uh, times t b tells you that the current has minus one plus two, which is one. 
That's great because it's a current. So it will integrate to give, give us a dimensionless charge. Dz of this will be a dimensionless charge. Okay. Now, it has some 1 by z square piece. That's whatever it is. It, it was a number. But the really important point is that when we are in the critical dimension, this has 0 divided by z. That 0 is c minus 15 of the matter, proportional to c minus 15 of the matter. You remember we went through such, such a discussion for the bosonic string? All of these properties are just completely mirrored by this thing. Why is this crucial? This is crucial because you remember that q squared, qb squared, which is anti same as anti of qb, it's qb, but it can be computed from the pole in the op, from jb with jb. And because the pole in the op is 0, this ensures that qb squared is equal to 0. Okay, so the first and total, the truly key, uh, the truly key property of this uh, of this current is that uh, it's that uh, is that its charge squares to zero. Uh, another property that's also true of this current, um, and you know you add some improvement terms to make it literally true, uh, is that it's a primary operator. So for instance, Tb times Jb uh, gives uh, 1 by Jb, uh, sorry, 1 by Z Jb plus, uh, sorry, 1 by Z squared Jb plus, uh, uh, plus del Jb by Z plus. So it transforms like a primary operator of dimension. Okay. Um, even for the bosonic string, if you remember, we didn't algebraically verify all these properties on the board, and I'm not, not even going to try for the super string, it's just much more complicated. But it's been done by zillions of people, and it works. Okay. Because, okay, now let's look at, uh, uh, let, let's look at some, some features of this, uh, uh -huh. this BRST current. Um, the first feature that we, we want to look at is the one that I wanted to, that I've referred to repeatedly, uh, and that goes this way. Um, let's look at this part, for instance. In this part, we have uh, uh, in this part we have a term that goes like gamma TF matter. Now TF matter was basically psi mu del mu x. So there's a term in the current that is gamma psi mu del mu x. Okay? Now, we want a BRST charge to be well defined, to be a good operator, maybe well defined in every physical situation. Okay? In particular, we want a BRST charge to be well defined both in the Ramon sector and in the NS sector. But there is some tension here because in the NS sector, or let's say if we were doing it on the on the plane in the Ramon sector, psi is, is half integer moded. Let's let's do it on the cylinder. On the cylinder in the NS sector, psi is half integer moded. Okay? So if gamma was integer moded, the whole object would be half integer moded, which would mean that JBRST would have expansion in terms of half integer moding, the zero mode would not be part of the expansion. And so there would be no BRST charge. Because the BRST charge is the integral of J, is the zero mode of J. Okay? So in order for there to exist a BRST charge, even in the Ramon sector, it is totally crucial that when psi is half integer moded, gamma is also half integer moded. Okay, this we have already actually implemented. We've already actually implemented this um, in the, the following thing, that when we looked at the beta, the beta gamma uh, ghost system, we talked about the ghost system 
in the Ramon sector. Okay, and if you looked at the vertex operators, when we put the uh, uh, fermions in the, in the Ramon sector, we also put the ghosts in the Ramon sector. And we coupled d to the power minus phi by 2 with the fermion being in the Ramon sector. And you might have asked why? What is the logical reason to do that? The ghosts, logically speaking, are uncorrelated. There are two answers to this. A, if you followed the original gauge fixing procedure, starting from supergravity on the world sheet of the string, this would be Foster. Okay, but the remnant in this gauge fix formalism is simply this, that if you want there to be exist a well-defined BRST charge, it will only exist provided the, uh, uh, the superconformal ghost and the fermions are both together in the NS sector, are both together in the Ramon sector. Is this clear? Okay, similarly, we have to, as I've already mentioned earlier in this class, we have to assign fermion number to the ghost, to the superconformal ghost. Because uh, otherwise the superconformal, uh, uh, the superconformal, this uh, JB would not have definite fermion number. For instance, that first term C times TBM would have fermion number zero, whereas this term gamma times TF would have fermion number one could not have definite fermion number. If it didn't have definite fermion number, then the problem of finding the BRST cohomology within a sector of definite fermion number would make no sense. Because the BRST cohomology would mix fermion numbers. And there, then the problem of imposing a projection with fermion number would make no sense. Because you can't both project with fermion number and restrict to BRST, a closed sex. So in order to be able to project to fermion number and impose a BRST condition, and look at the co BRST cohomology together, it better be that your BRST charge commute with fermion number. So it better be that gamma is also assigned fermion number. And that is the underlying reason for assigning the fermion number so that the, the ghost, the e to the power phi, had charge one. Is this clear? Okay? Good. So the structure of this BRST current dictates many otherwise seemingly arbitrary choices in, in what we've done. It's sort of, because these choices wouldn't have been arbitrary if you started with the super conform, you know, just started with the super gravity action and try to fix it. But now that we've not done that, the structure of this BRST current determines is the thing that remembers all of that. And it's the thing that forces, forces you to be honest, forces you to do the right thing. Okay, now once we have this current, of course, we can mode expand every every mode in the game. We mode expand C, we mode expand X, we mode expand Psi, we mode expand Beta, we mode expand Gamma, and then we mode expand the current itself. So we mode expand the current as JB is equal to sum over M, J uh, B M, Z to pi M plus one. JB0 is QB. JB0 is the BRST charge itself. So JB0 is QBRST can then be written in terms of the modes of the other fields. Okay? And uh, uh, it's a simple though slightly tedious exercise. Um, to work out the mode expansion, I'm just going to write out the result for you. GRs are the expansions of TF, just like LMs are the expansions of TB. GRs are the expansions of TF. Okay, so, so TF is equal to GR divided by Z to the power 3 by 2 plus R. Okay, so the moments of TF. Okay, uh, then minus half um, N minus M. B of minus M minus 
n c m c n uh, plus sum over m r half 2 r minus m norm loaded b minus m minus r c m gamma r uh, minus b minus m gamma m minus r gamma r and here i should have put lm minus minus a g delta m zero where a g is the normal ordering constant is equal to half in the ns sector and whatever three by two the weight of e to the power pi uh, sorry minus half in the ns sector and uh, ag is equal to minus three by two in the ramon sector okay if you go back to your notes and you look at the expansion of the QBRST charge for the bosonic string, you will see very similar expansion. This part was basically identical, except that this AG there was one, the normal ordering constant of the, uh, the normal ordering constant of the bosonic string, corresponding to the fact that the vertex operator, uh, the vertex operator for the va for the vacuum on the ghost sector there was just C. Okay. So C had this, oh, oh, sorry, plus, 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 plus. This is plus H. After that sorry? After yeah, this is plus, but I think this should also be plus here. Plus, because it should be L minus one in the bosonic string or L minus half in the uh, super string so that L is, the matter part of L is forced to be half as we've seen, right, in the vertex operator condition, matter part of L has to be half in the NS sector, has to be um, uh, three, uh, 3 by 8 in the Ramon sector. It's just that vertex operator thing that we did in the earlier part of the lecture. Okay, so this is the, the BRST charge. And uh, the claim is that, you know, as in the bosonic string, the allowed vertex operators, the vertex op operators we're going to allow ourselves to scatter are states that lie in the cohomology of this BRS teacher. Now, one can go through a formal exercise, very much like we went through in the case of the bosonic string, to show that the cohomology of this BRST charge is the same as the, is in one-to-one -one correspondence with the spectrum of the superstring in light cone gauge. Namely, it's in one-to-one -one correspondence with the set of states which have no ghost oscillations, no super ghost oscillations, no one and zero oscillations, either for x or for psi. Only uh, oscillations just from i is equal to one to eight polarizations for i is equal to 1 to 8, both in the x, or x directions and the psi directions. In fact, the arguments are basically identical to the ones we used. The procedure is as, is, is as before. We take the, um, um, we take the, uh, um, uh, the, uh, uh, the BRST charge and write it in terms of a BRST charge, uh, in terms of a piece with, uh, with light cone charge. There's a piece with light cone charge plus one, a piece with light cone charge zero, and a piece with light cone charge minus one. Then we consider the uh, uh, cohomology of the piece with light cone charge plus one, as we did before. We find a very simple cohomology, which we can just enumerate. It's exactly the same kind of argument. And then we go through the kind of arguments that tell us that actually the cohomology of these two things are the same. Most of the argument in the case of the bosonic string was basically abstract. Very few places did we use the detailed nature of the expressions for the charges, if you remember. They were largely abstract arguments. These arguments carry through basically without change. 
and I'm going to leave it for you as an exercise to just go through those arguments in your mind and work them out for the super tree. Okay, so once we've worked that argument out for the bosonic string, it basically carries through almost without chain for the super string. Okay, so the same thing tells us that you know we've got a very lovely cohomology. The fact that our BRST charge commutes with mi minus one to the power f tells us that we can impose the BRST charge as a cohomology fermion number sector by fermion number sector. So we can consistently work with the JSO project. The fact that it is the BRST charge is well defined both in Ramon and Nebuchadnezzar sectors tells us that we can consistently in each sector impose this cohomology condition. Okay. So our set of vertex operators are basically in one to one with the BRST cohomology. Okay. Now, uh, very brief, I hope to go through this picture changing business, but okay. Uh, we'll take one more, one more lecture before we, before I give you the rules for string, super string scattering amplitudes. But in the rest of this lecture, let us undertake a little exercise just to familiarize, familiarize ourselves with this BRST charge a little bit. And that little exercise is this. In the, uh, in the, uh, at level half in the NS sector, let's work out the BRST call. Okay, so we're going to need this expression here. Uh, so I'll clear this part. Oh, I shouldn't have. Okay, one of the uh, one of one, sorry, you might remember that uh, J B in the bos case of the bosonic string J B of z times b of 0 um, was t of z. Do you remember this? That uh, uh, it came from, you know, we have a c times t term. And therefore, when we, when we did the jb times b, the b hit the c to give this t. Okay, it came from there. Now, the, uh, this continues to be true in, uh, uh, for, for this more complicated thing, but something else also continues to be true. That JB of Z times beta of zero gives TF of zero. Of zero. Uh, TF of zero, uh, sorry, I should have put this. So this was uh, uh, one plus uh, two, uh, and this was z square, therefore, no, this was z. Kg is one by z. What? Kg is one by z. Yeah, one by z, yes, exactly. Because Cb was one by z. Cb was one by z, exactly. Uh, or just add up this thing, this was one, this is two, so that's three. This is two, so this is uh, <coughs> the third. <coughs> um, uh, similarly here, we get this to the one by z. Both of these have decreased by half. Now, this tells us that the commutator of QBRST with B um, R is equal to LR by the usual contour arguments. Do you remember this? You make the charge QBRST by integrating this with zero, you make the charge this with integrating it by the appropriate factor, and then you'll get LR. Similarly, you get QBRST times beta R is equal to GR. What? JB? T board. The same, the usual contour arguments. Okay. So there is one immediate thing that follows when we look at BRST cohomology. We used exactly this when studying the bosonic string, which was this. You remember we put these auxiliary conditions, beta zero on psi is equal to zero. And now we'll also put beta zero on psi is equal to zero. Okay. 
But the, the state psi is going to be annihilated both by PRST and by beta 0. So it's annihilated by both terms in this antiform unit. Therefore, it has to be annihilated by this guy when, L, uh, when R is 0. So this, this implied L0 on psi was equal to 0. Okay? And this implies that G0 on psi is equal to 0. Okay, is this clear? Okay, so the condition that uh, we were searching for BRST cohomologies together with these conditions tell us that our states always have to have 0 L0 be annihilated by both by the 0 mode of, uh, T, uh, of, L, of L as well as the 0 mode of the superconformal part of the, uh, of the stress tensor. Okay, so um, now now we now now let's let's move on. <coughs> so what we what we plan to do is to try to find the whole BRST cohomology. So uh, 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 and of course the fact that QBRST has weight zero tells us that QBRST with L zero is zero. QR, uh, QBR, uh, BRST doesn't change the energy of states because it's got dimension zero, it's weight zero. Okay, so Q, uh, BRST cohomology can be found energy by energy, level by level. Okay, so let's say we're in the NS sector and uh, we first work at level zero. So there we've got just the total vacuum. This is vacuum in ghost and vacuum in uh, vacuum in ghost and vacuum in matter. Okay, you might ask which ghost vacuum? Well, we know it's the one that's annihilated by B0. Okay, and you can ask which super ghost vacuum? Well, we know it's the one that's annihilated by beta 0. Okay, now we want to find, we want to check that this is inside BRST cohomology, but that's very simple. That's very simple because this state is annihilated by QB. How do we know it's annihilated by QB? It's, we know it's annihilated by QB because this state, this state time, sorry, 0 and e to the pi k dot x with the k squared equals Half. is annihilated by QB. Why? Well, it's annihilated by QB because every operator here is made up of one creation and one annihilation except things that come with both zeros. Okay, so for instance, in here, in this expression here, we have M, N, C, M, C, N. Okay, we've got M, N, C, M, C, N. It's impossible for all terms here to be um, negative or zero. Uh, because if this and this were both zero, we would get C zero squared, which was zero. Okay. Uh, Naively, there's a term which is B0 times C0 squared. That's zero, it's also zero because this would make it zero. Yeah. Okay, similarly here. Okay, you will, you, will, you will not be able to get a term where, uh, where which is not annihilated, uh, which is not, does not have one annihilation operator at least. Here we can get such a term. We can get a C0 times L0 plus whatever, this AG. Okay, but that is precisely the thing that we got when, you know, when we took the commutator of uh, uh, QB with B0, we got L0. It's the full L0 
So it's L matter plus AG because that AG was the contribution of L0 from the coast vacuum. Okay? And this is 0 provided k squared is equal to half. So that L matter of our state will cancel the AG. All we're saying is that the annihilation of this BRST operator forces us to choose L0 is equal to 0. Full L0 equals 0 that we knew from here. And that's the instantiation of it here. Okay? Since we're in the NS sector, there are no zeros here with gammas because uh, uh, all uh, 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 we, 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 we're working on, uh, um, you know, we have uh, psi minus half, psi, th psi minus three halves, similarly gamma minus half, gamma minus three halves, it's all in half integer mode. Okay? So clearly at least one of these has to be uh, annihilation. This annihilates. Okay. So Isn't this R half or it's half integers. R's are half integers because we are in the NS sector. If we were in the Raman sector, they would be integers. Is this clear? No, I thought uh, the sum over R is I mean belongs to J plus nu. Z plus nu. So it's so the sum over R? Yeah, yeah. No, no, it's, it's, not, it's not included because, you know, we want to sum over the moding of the oscillators. The, 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 the oscillators in the NS sector are half integer moded. Is this clear? Okay. Okay, uh, one, uh, wonderful. So, this state clearly annihilates the state as long as k squared is equal to half. But um, since nothing's going to change the k of the state. So, every k by k we have a BRST charge. As long as k squared is equal to half, the state annihilates that state. Uh, this uh, this uh, BRST state annihilates. Okay. Moreover, at any given value of k, we've already seen that there is a unique state at oscillator number zero. We've also seen that BRST cohomology respects respects oscillator number because BRST BRST charge commutes with L zero. So if this state was BRST exact. It could only have been QB acting on this state itself. Because at oscillator number 0, there was a unique such state. The BRST cohomology problem is closed oscillator number by oscillator number. Okay? But we've already seen that QBRST annihilates this state. So at this level, there are no BRST in exact states. So this state is QRST, BRST closed but not BRST exact and therefore would have been physical except for the fact that it's projected out by the GSO projection. Okay, we went through an entirely analogous discussion when discussing the physicality of the, of the vacuum uh, of the bosonic string, except there there was no GSO projection to save us. So we had to conclude that that was a physical state. Here we would have concluded the same thing from BRST analysis. It's just the GSO projection that saves us. Okay, now let us go to the next level. Let us go to the level where we have psi minus half mu, uh, let's say a mu, plus um, gamma minus half plus theta one gamma minus half plus theta two beta minus half acting on 0k. Can you see this is the first excited state? Okay? At this level, we don't have to worry about the BC oscillators because those are molded in units of 1. So exciting with them or exciting with x's will raise the energy by 1. We want the first excited state, which raises energy just by half. This also corresponds, as we've seen before, to the massless sector of the theory. Because in this case, the half here cancels the AG from here, makes this physical by itself, I mean makes this zero by itself. So in this case, k squared is equal to zero. 
from physicality. Is this clear? Okay. Now we've already explained that the uh, 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 that the ghosts here are going to play basically no role. The ordinary C and B ghosts. Right? Everything interesting is happening with the beta gamma system. Okay. So let's look at uh, terms in this cube. So so now what we want to do? Uh, we're going to play the same game. We're going to take Q B R S T and act on this state. Because QBRST commutes with oscillator number with L0, there's going to be a BRST problem just in this 12 dimensional state space. Why 12 dimensional? Because there are 10 here, 1 here, and 1 here. Okay? So just in this 12 dimensional state space, there is a BRST cohomology problem, and we're going to try to solve that problem. Okay. So in order to do that first, the, the thing we're going to do is to act with this BRST charge on this most general state and see what we get. Okay. So first let's see what we get that, that is non-zero when acting on this guy. Okay. So this part, um, this part here uh, never contributes anything. This part is just zero. We, uh, we, I, either we will get uh, creation or uh, you know annihilation operators from the LMs. Oh wait wait wait. Will we get? Yeah yeah. Because these LMs are modded with integers. So we could uh, the, the the first annihilation here is an L minus one. Acting on a state with dimension half. Always takes us into annihilation territory. Had there been an L half, minus half, we could have got something interesting. Is this clear? Right? Because this is purely matter. This is purely ghost. Okay? Right. Right. So you see, this term can give us nothing interesting. This term can give us something interesting because there are halves here. Okay? So let's look at the term where this is minus half. I I'm going to act on this. Because I want to act on this, I want. No, no annihilation operator in gamma. Because if there was an annihilation operator in gamma, it would kill the part involving Amy. Okay? But I'm going to allow for annihilation operators in G. Because there's a creation operator in gamma, uh, inside. So I'm going to allow for G half. Now G was psi del x. I don't want any annihilation operators in the del x. Otherwise, it will kill me. So all of the annihilation has to come in psi. So I want to look for the term that was psi mu half times del x 0. Del x 0 was k mu, the 0 mode. Okay. So the term of interest here is k mu psi mu half. Is this clear? Acting with k mu psi mu half, the psi mu half will kill the psi mu minus half. And so what I'll get is a mu k mu. Okay, with gamma minus half. Because the gamma minus half has gotten dropped to the right. Okay, so acting on this state, on this part gave us this. Now let's look at this part. On this part, what do we get? Here we could have the gamma plus half and g minus half. How are we going to get g minus half? Okay, if we don't want to involve any annihilation operators, um, okay, so let's, uh, g should not involve any annihilation operators at all. g is psi del x. G should not involve any annihilation operators at all. It should be both creation. The only way for two creation operators to add up to half is to get the half creation in psi and the zero creation in x. So once again, zero creation is a k-mu. Okay, this kills this. And so we get plus theta one k-mu psi minus half mu.
All good? Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I did this wrong because it's uh, sorry. It's the, uh, the, the, the that, that's what I get when I act on this theta two because uh, psi minus half act as uh, gamma minus half kills beta half. It's like it's like that BC, BC kind of thing. Right? Okay. So we get this theta 2 business and uh, that whole thing will appear yeah, with the psi minus half. Okay, now uh, uh, what about uh, uh, what about this state? What about this theta 1 state? Uh, This theta one state uh, will never work, right? So this guy is just killed. There's nothing here that can uh, uh, preserve it. The beta term here, you know, the beta term here would have to involve something with the C ghosts. Okay. Now the only term that could could potentially be involved is C zero. Okay, and the term involving C zero we're guaranteed will work out in the end because you see uh, if we act with C0 we move from the state which was uh, uh, B0 which annihilated by B0 to the state that's annihilated by uh, C0 okay and that cannot happen it cannot happen provided uh, provided uh, uh, let, let me give you that it will work out and I can show you algebraically, but let me give you the general argument which is more informative. You see, uh, the point was this. The point was that it was consistent to work in the cohomology sector in states annihilated by B0. Why was it consistent? It was consistent because of this, this relationship. This with B0 was L0. So provided L, in fact, that's the reason we imposed L0 equals 0. So that we can consistently work in the sector of states that were annihilated by, by B0. Okay? Now, if there's anything in the, in the cohomology where we started with a state annihilated by B0, if there's something non-zero with some state where C0 acts on it, we will go outside that sector. We know all that must cancel. Okay, so we could work it out, but such things will always cancel. The end. So I'm not even considering that. Okay, I'll just leave it for you to work out. Okay, so this this state is just annihilated by itself, so it's just zero. Okay. Now, so so what have, what have we got? We've got the action of QBRST on this gives us this. Is this clear? So firstly, what states are not annihilated by, so the BRST cohomology is a set of states that are annihilated by, by QB, modulo those states that are QB exact. Okay, so the first condition that we need is that for to be in BRST cohomology, mu k mu must be equal to zero. Otherwise it does not annihilate the state. And Theta 2 must be 0. So the state is Q closed only if A mu K mu is equal to 0 and Theta 2 is equal to 0. Is this clear? Otherwise Q B R S T on the state is not 0. Moreover, any such state what, what do we get here? Here what we got is this kind of state with a mu replaced by k mu. So any such state, mod, we, we need these conditions modulo the equivalences. a mu is to be identified with a mu plus k mu. And modulo the equivalences, 
theta 1 is to be identified with theta 1 plus shift. So the theta 1 part of the state is pure gauge, it's BRST uh, exact and the part of AMU, any shift in AMU that is of the form KMU is also pure gauge. Now you might think look how could it be, you might think this condition is redundant because from this condition A dot K is 0. So if a dot k is 0, then a plus k dot k being 0 can only work if k squared was 0. But k squared is 0. So it's not a redundant condition. It's a physical condition. Okay? So what have we concluded? We've concluded, you see, the ghost terms, this guy was set to 0 by the condition that it be BRST closed. This guy was not set to 0, but was BRST exact. So the ghost terms were both unimportant. The matter terms, of the 10 matter terms, we had one condition, a dot k was 0. And in addition, we had one equivalence, which is after setting a dot k equals 0, a had to be identified with a plus k. If you shift a by, by an admixture of k, you get the same state. Now, <coughs> Um, we, all of this is ex of course extremely familiar to you. The first two conditions merely tell us that anything involving the ghost is physically trivial. The f a dot k term tells us that the polarization vector behind k has to be transverse to momentum. And this condition tells us that, where did that come from if you think of in terms of electromagnetism? comes from basically string theory is working in Lorentz gauge. Fair enough, right? It's manifestly covariant. Which other gauge could you choose? Okay? But now in Lorentz gauge, anything that obeys uh, <coughs> AMU proportional to KMU is still pure gauge. You can still because on shell k squared is equal to 0, you can shift k mu, a mu by k mu and maintain k dot uh, del dot k is equal to 0, k dot k is, e a is equal to 0, that's what we've just seen. Shifting by k mu is a gauge transformation. So such a mode is pure gauge. Okay? So basically this is a familiar low energy st statement. And if, if we were working with the open string, in fact, it would reduce to Yang mills here. In the context of the closed string, there's one statement on the left, one statement like this on the right, and in fact, there's a similar statement about gravity. Uh, well, let me let me tell you. In two minutes, we should stop. But I, let me tell you about that in two minutes more. You see, so what have we got for the cohomology? We've got that we've got a mu b nu psi minus half, now I'm putting left and right together, psi tilde minus half, such that <coughs> a dot k is equal to 0, b dot k is equal to 0, okay, and a is identified with a plus k, b is identified with uh, b plus k, okay. So this object here is a two tensor. This object here is a two tensor which we can break up into its symmetric, tra symmetric traceless, anti-symmetric and trace paths. Let me focus for a moment on the symmetric traceless part. In this uh, situation what we've got is a two tensor which is symmetric traceless, okay? It's, it's, the basis is made by A mu's and B mu's. Okay, the outer product is two tensor. Two tensor, because there's one A mu, okay? And this, uh, this tensor has, obeys the condition k dot either of its indices is 0. That's working with gravity in Lorentz gauge. And it's, it's also obeys the condition that if you take the h mu nu and shift it by k mu, 
nothing changes. This is simply the linearized gauge transformation, linearized coordinate transformation of gravity. Okay? So what we're getting here is that the BRST cohomology gives us at low energies a very reasonable kind of cohomology, namely what you get from gravity. More precisely, as we've seen, we get a, two, a symmetric two tensor, that's the gravity. We also get something anti-symmetric. That's B mu nu, the Carl Bromon field, which has its own gauge invariance, which required all of this. And you also get a, a trace, which is what we call in string theory the dilettante. So in the Raman sector, in the massless sector of the Raman sector, we're getting a graviton, an anti-symmetric tensor, and a scalar called the dilaton. All these are massless. And we're actually seeing the gauge invariances of the symmetric tensor and the anti-symmetric tensor in front of our eyes, coming for just directly inherited from the BRST transformations. Okay? Now, um, <coughs> one last thing um, I'm going to go through for you, which is this. You remember that uh, we required G in the Ramond sector, apart from, uh, in the Ramond sector, apart from requiring L0 anhydrous the state, we had the algebra up here. You also had G0 anhydrous the state. G0 anhydrous the state is a condition only in the Ramond sector, because in the Neville Schwartz sector, G is half integer modded. So G0 annihilating it makes no sense. Okay? Uh, but in the Ramon sector, there's this condition that G0 annihilate the state. Now, what is G0? G, as we've many times said, is uh, psi del x. Now, how is G0 going to annihilate the state? Okay, so let's suppose we were doing now BRST uh, analysis uh, in the Ramon sector. So, we work in the Ramon sector. And there is, you know, in the Ramon sector, we've got the Ramon sector vacuum, which is made up of the spinner in the, in the fermions. Let's first look at that level without further exciting. So the, the vacuum itself has a certain dimension, it's dimension 5 by 8. Let's work at that without, without, without further exciting it with the additional fermions. Let's look at that for a moment. Okay? Now, already here, there are plenty of states because there are all the degenerate states of the spinner. Okay? Now, one of the conditions that follows from BRST invariance is that G on that state, G0 on that state is 0. That came from commuting the BRST charge with beta 0. B, G0, G was just side LX. Now, since we haven't excited any oscillators, either in the in the pos in, either in x or in psi, we'll only get something zero, uh, non-zero if both psi and del x were zero. So, acting on the spinner state, we get the condition psi mu zero times k mu on psi is equal to zero. Now, what is the action of psi mu zero on the spinners? Why did we get spinners in the first place? Because we had psi mu zero, we had to quantize them. What was the quantization? Psi mu zero, psi mu zero, anti-commutator was equal to delta mu. Nu. What was this? This was the Clifford algebra. So the implementation, psi mu zero was quantized by replacing them by gamma matrices. So psi mu zero on the spinner space is gamma matrices. So what this is is gamma dot k on psi is equal to zero. What is that condition? Dirac. It's a massless Dirac equation. So one of the implications of BRST co uh, co uh, the, the BRST story in the in the Ramon sector is that in the Ramon sector the BRST equation imposes that the on shell states obey the massless Dirac equation. Okay? 
Now, in the Raman sector, that's it. You have these, these conditions uh, in the ground state of the Raman sector, that's it. Yeah. The things that obey this condition and, of course, the GSO projection are, uh, are physical. So, for massless states, we've, we've, we've got, for massless states, the physical states are, the physical states are uh, a mu, psi mu, minus half, subject to these conditions in the NS sector, and chiral spinner, chiral or antichiral spinner, obeying Dirac equation in the Ramon sector. This is what we have in the uh, um, uh, in the NS sector and Ramon sector, on the left moving side. But we can cross this with the same thing. And uh, chiral or uh, anti-chiral spinner. On the right hand side. This gives us the full massless um, of st state content of type 2 theory. It's type 2b if the spinners have the same chirality. Type 2a if the spinners have opposite chirality. Okay. So let's 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 decompose this into physical particles. Rho NS NS gives us, as we've seen, B mu nu, phi, and G mu nu. The graviton, B mu nu, and phi. Now we could we have two RNS sectors. We could have left in NS and right in Ramond, or vice versa. Okay? And what do we get from there, from those? We get the tensor product of a vector times a spinner. Now, why is, why is the tensor product of a vector times a spinner? Suppose I've got a vector and a spinner, can you decompose it for me into, in terms of representations of S, of the S, of SO? Vector times spinner is two, a sum of two representations. Vector times spinner, so suppose I've got a mu. One thing I can do is multiply by gamma mu and then act on the spinner. This, if, you, if this was a chiral spinner, gives me an anti-chiral spinner. Firstly, it's a spinner because the vector index, index has been contracted. So the whole thing contracts like a spinner. Secondly, chirality is flicked because you multiply with one factor of gamma. So if gamma 5 was plus, now it's minus. Okay? So what you get is a spinner of opposite chirality. Okay? Or there is just, you know, the direct product of the vector and the spinner with this part removed. This is sometimes called a Rarita Schwinger spinner. It's a spin 3 half particle. Okay, in supergravity, a Rarita Schwinger spinner, uh, sometimes called psi mu alpha, is the super partner of the graviton. Because supersymmetric partner of spin 2 particles should be spin 3 halves. Okay, so in the Ramon Nebuchadnezzar sector, we get two particles. We get spinners of opposite chirality from the one we started with, and we get Rarita Schwinger spinners of the same chirality as the one we started with. We have two Rarita Schwinger spinners and two ordinary spinners. In type 2a theory, the two ordinary spinners and two Rarita Schwinger sp spinners are of opposite chirality. You have one ordinary spinner of positive and one negative chirality. Similarly, with the Rarita. Type 2b theory is of the same chirality. Though the ordinary spinners have opposite sp chirality from the Rarita Schwinger, but, but the two ordinary spinners have the same chirality. And the two Rarita Schwinger spinners have the same chirality. The opposite of each other. Is this clear? The Rarita Schwinger spinner was just the part that remains. So suppose, yeah, there are two representations. 
let me let me give you the let's work it out first in sp for SO3. Okay, so um, this is the analog of the following thing. If you take for SU2, you take spin half with spin one. You get one spin three half. That's my like my Radita spin spin half, and one spin half. Okay, we could also work it out for SO4 if you want. Okay, so it's just some other representation. It's a representation that you may not know the name for. Okay, but it's a, it's a representation that appears in particle physics, especially in the supergravity religions. It's a representation involving a spin three half field. Okay, fine. Now, Finally, there is the question, what happens when you take two spinners? What happens in the Ramon Ramon sector? Now what do we have? Now we have spinner time spinner. Who knows the group theory for spinner time spinner? What? 1 plus 0, that would be right in <laughs> SU2. <laughs> yes. You get a bunch of forms. How do we know this? How do we decompose? Suppose you have psi bar, psi. You can put a bunch of gammas in the middle. Okay? And you get, then you get an object with anti-symmetric indices. Objects with anti-symmetric indices are called forms. Now you can't put more than two, or more than d gammas. Yeah, or a gamma square will be one, so it'll be like putting nothing. Okay, but actually, when your uh, spinner is chiral, you can't put more than in the in the case where you have SO10, for instance. You can't even put more than five gammas. Because acting on a chiral spinner, a product of five gammas, a product of six gammas, same as product of four gammas. Okay? So what you get is a bunch of forms. Um, what you get is a bunch of forms, and the precise nature of the forms that you get depends on whether you're doing chiral, chiral or chiral with antichiral. Okay, this I will work out a little in a little, uh, little more carefully next class because, we have, uh, because it's important and we have to understand it properly. Okay, but it will turn out in the end, the answer will be that in type 2a theory, the effective, um, um, uh, the effective fields in the theory will be a one form, a three form, and a five form, and a self dual five form. Um, potential. Whereas in type 2b theory, you will have effectively a zero form, say a scalar, a two form and a four form potential. Okay? And this is the net state content of the massless sector of type 2 string theory. It's bosonic fields from the NSNS sector, that's the dilaton, B mu nu, and the graviton, bosonic fields from the Ramon Ramon sector, th this bunch of forms. Notice that in type 2b theory, I told you you got a zero form, but in the NS sector, we also got a, a zero form, namely the dil dilaton. I told you you got a two form. But in the NS sector, we also got a two form, which was B mu nu. And I told you, you got a four form. Well, we didn't get a four form in the NS sector, but uh, this four form is gonna be very special. This is actually the first indication that type 2B is built to be self-dual under S-duality. You know, it's got a, a bunch of fields with duplication. You've got two scalars, two two forms. Hmm. 
So it could be that there's a symmetry in the theory where you exchange things. Um, and this symmetry we will, we will study as we go along. It's called S duality. Okay, in type 2A theory, there's another interesting thing to notice. We will we'll come, we'll look at all this in some detail as we, as, as we go along. Okay, uh, but I think we'll stop the class here today. Any uh, questions or comments? I, I, I'll work out the group theory for the Ramon Ramon sector in more detail next class. Uh, we'll work out the, uh, we'll understand this stuff better next class. But uh, uh, this was just to give you this, this appetizer. Any, any more questions or comments? So, so what we have gone through is the principles that determine what the physical states are on the well sheet of the superstring. And we've understood how that's implemented at the massless sector, at the massless level. Okay. What remains is to understand the physics of this better, of course. But the last key technical thing that I have to tell you about is the rules for calculating scattering amplitudes for the superstring. Once we have that in place, then we will, we will use formalism only as needed to understand physics. And then we will start trying to understand the physics of the subject much better. 